Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, whether uh, in person, whether on Zoom. Uh, thank you to Rabbi Bastalnik for organizing this series. Uh, and thank you, Menasha, for the uh, technical support, very important technical support for the more technically challenged rabbi. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, the topic tonight is how to handle matters of Lashon Hara regarding serious inquiries, such as Shituchim and professional matters. And I think just as a very brief introduction, it's very significant to recognize that we have two psukim in the Torah, and, and I'm sure Rebbe Stanley touched on many of these things, but, but we'll sort of focus on this in a practical context now. We have two psukim in the Torah that are very, that really are pulling in two opposite directions. And one is Loselech Rachel Ba'amecha, not to be a talebearer. And it also says Losam Adam Reacha, don't stand on your brother's blood. And this is challenging. And this is the challenge that people have when they get a phone call about someone asking, again, whether it be in a professional context, whether it be in a shit of context, where they know that they don't have only the most best things to say about this person. On the one hand, they don't want to say something negative about a person. On the other hand, they certainly don't want to be in, uh, guilty of giving poor advice to someone, and maybe even worse than poor advice, letting a person make a terrible life mistake when they asked the question and I could have given them the honest answer and, and I didn't, and, and now look what happened to them. So it's a very complicated thing. And, and like complicated matters, uh, Halacha gives us guidance. Uh, what we're really going to focus on tonight are different excerpts from Sefer Chafetz Chaim. As I'm sure many of you know, uh, the Chafetz Chaim wrote very significant work about loss of Lashon Hara and Rechilas. Um, but we're just going to take a small, some small snippets of things that he says, but I think they're very central to this topic. And um, I'm very happy to take practical questions. I would ask that people not ask questions in a way that make it evident what they're talking about, because that would be an issue of Lush and Hara. But uh, hopefully we'll go through some some very relevant practical matters. Um, just one more thing to think about. I just pick this back up. Um, there we go. Thank you. Just uh, one more thing to think about is the um, what would you do if you had two very dear friends and one of them was considering taking the other as a business as a business partner and you don't think it's a good idea because you know something negative about the second one. That is the halachic shaila whether you know the second party or you don't know the second party or the first party, whatever. In other words, we have to look out for each other. We have a lack of obligation to look out for each other. So the whole idea, this happens all the time when people get phone calls about Shidduchim, I have to figure out whose side I'm on. And whoever side I'm on, that's who I'm interested in. And if I mislead or, or, or neglect to give information to the second side, it's not my problem. That's not a very Jewish way of thinking about this situation. So just kind of frame that a little bit. Okay, here we go. We're going to get started at the beginning of the source sheet. And the Chafetz Chaim says as follows. If one person sees that his friend wants to go into some business with another, and the third party, the person observing this all, assesses, that this is going to be very bad. It's going to be a very bad idea to include this partner. He has a responsibility to tell the first fellow, so as to save him from this very difficult situation. I want to emphasize this. It's clear that the Chafetz Chaim is not even talking about when someone called you and asked a question. You see it happen. Nobody asked your opinion, but you know something. And you know that if they would know what you know, they wouldn't be doing this. You should tell them. You should insert yourself into it. And broadly speaking, in halacha, it really doesn't make a difference. We'll see one scenario where maybe it makes a little bit of a difference, but broadly, it doesn't make a difference if you're being asked or not. If it's correct for you to say it, you should say it, whether you're being asked or you're volunteering it. And if you shouldn't be saying it, it doesn't matter that you're asked. But, but there are five rules that need to be uh, accommodated in order to share this negative information about the person. And these are they. Number one, a person needs to be very, very careful. 
you should not immediately assess this. Whatever you know, you shouldn't assess it as being automatically a negative thing. You have to think about it well to begin with, if this really is bad in the first place. Imagine the following situation. Someone calls me and they ask, you know, what, what kind of fellow is so-and-so? And I start going through my generic, you know, this, that, and the other. And then as I'm thinking about it, I say, or I think to myself, you know, there was one time I looked up in Shul and I saw him come in and he looked very upset about something. Uh, okay. Now, is it possible that this in indicates some deep-seated problem in the person? It's possible. Is it possible that he's just upset because he came late to Shoal or because someone, you know, called him and told him something upsetting? Of course it's possible. So this is number one. Before you even get to whether to say it or not, you have to really think about, am I even assessing this situation correctly or not? And I think particularly when it comes to when people ask our advice about someone, I think we have a great, great struggle here because I think we all want to be pretty smart. I, I think it's human nature. So I don't want to be the person who just says the three generic sentences. I want to be, you know, my friend from New Jersey called me. They're counting on me to tell them about so-and-so. And I have this deep analysis of the person. It's based on a lot of data. It's not based on a lot of data. It doesn't matter either way. It's brilliant. So, so this is, again, it's very simple, but it's very important to think about. Make sure you actually know what you're talking about. Item number one. Item number two. Shloyagdil besipuro es ha'inyan l'ra yoser mimashahu. You shouldn't magnify the matter greater than what it actually is. That's a very significant thing. Um, many times we have a way of exaggerating things. Uh, I think again. I think there's a strong. I I, I think there's a strong inclination. Um, we want to impress the person that we're talking to. We want them to believe that what we're conveying is significant. And I think when we get when we get into that mode, it's very common to emphasize things and even magnify them in ways that are not factually accurate. So I have to have clarity myself, and I have to make sure to convey it in a clear way. Number three, huh, this is really, really difficult. She chavein rak letoelas that the reason why I'm sharing this is for a productive purpose. My goal is to save a person from a bad situation. And not out of a sense of enmity for the person about whom I'm speaking. This is really, really challenging. So just, just imagine that there's someone who wronged you two years ago. And now you get a phone call and, 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 and you never, he never righted the wrong and it's always bothered you, but you're a from person and, and you don't, you don't talk about these things. And now you get a phone call that, that someone wants to know, I, I was, someone suggested a shidduch with that person's child. Could you tell me about that person? And this is like an amazing opportunity because you get to say all the things you've wanted to say for all this time, and you're doing it in the, in the, for the sake of uh, making sure to protect another person. So fascinatingly, he says, if you're getting pleasure from doing it, you can't say it. This is really, I mean, this is, this is hard. This is hard. So, so this means that you, you, you know exactly what you're talking about. You, you're going to say it in a very careful way, but you're really going to enjoy it. You're not the one to say it then. And, and it would seem that the again, so I think a lot of these discussions really have to do with so how do I how do I handle it? If if I can't say these things, it's one of the greatest problems when people call with a question about a shidduch or a professional. <laughs> Someone calls you up and they ask, tell me about so and so. And and by the way, you generally don't have any lead time. They just tell you the name and now you're supposed to respond. So if you say, well, I have to talk to my rabbi before I respond. That's probably not a good idea because, uh, you know, it comes off pretty negative. Um, by the way, what I have heard people um, say before, and, and I, I think I have heard people suggest 
if it's somebody who you really do have to think about what is appropriate, what's not appropriate, maybe you shouldn't say anything at all. Maybe you should say a lot. It, it's always good. You could always say, I have, I have another phone call I have to take or something like that. You know, just make some excuse. I hope nobody calls me with a shit of question. I say that in the next week or so, because that'll be bad. But, but, uh, but so what are you supposed to do? Let, let's go to the, the second thing. We, the second thing isn't so complicated. The second thing, just be careful not to exaggerate things. That okay. The first thing is, I know something, and what I know, I'm, I'm, I don't think it's good, but I really don't know if this is indicative of the person. So we're going to talk about this a little more later, but I think on a basic level, the most practical response in that case is to just say, you know, I really don't know the person well. That's the point. That's the point in the first example. They are, I, 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 there's something on my mind that bothers me, right? But I, I really don't know if it was just a bad day or if it's indicative of something else. So it would be wrong. By the way, if there's something that bothers me, it'd be wrong for me to say he's a great guy. That wouldn't be correct either. But it would be wrong for me to, to, to say this like little thing that maybe it's a big deal, maybe it's not. So probably what makes the most sense is for me to say, and it's honest. I really don't know the person well. I'm probably not the one to talk to. The more complicated one is number three, where you where you had you had this issue with them, and you know them very well, and you have real stuff to say, but it's it's very you're going to have a lot of pleasure in saying it. Which, by the way, just to take a step back, if you're going to have a lot of pleasure in saying it, it probably means that it's most likely you're not going to relay it so accurately in the first place. Just when you think about it. In other words, if I'm emotionally involved in this, I'm probably not going to say it over very well. That's just something else to think about. So I think in that case, one can say one of two things. I think in that case, one thing one can say is, I really don't think I'm the one to talk to. That's hard to, hard to sometimes sell because uh, first of all, it could, be, it could be that people know about your relationship with the person. But even if not, if you really are, are emotionally pained by the person in some way, to, 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 to say some very neutral, I'm probably not the one to talk to, you're probably not going to say it very well. What, what might be a pre-actual thing to say is to say, you know, I have to be very honest with you. I have had a disagreement with the person before. Um, I, I didn't have a positive experience with them, but it could be that him and I just didn't click. And it could be that that's not indicative of, of the broader character, et cetera. I'm probably not the best one for you to talk to. I don't know. I, ideally, that wouldn't. I, ideally, I think one would say the former, but I'm not sure how easily we could pull off the former. Now, what would be the wrong thing to say is, "Oh, you don't want to talk to me. I had a terrible experience with them. I got all kinds of negative stuff to say." That's that. That, that does not seem correct. Um, continuing in Gimel, continuing in Gimel, he has in parentheses here. Prada Gimel Nichlal Gamkin Odin and Acher. There's another thing here. Besides the fact that you're supposed to have positive things in mind and not a sense of enmity, a person has to really think, is this really going to be a purposeful conversation? And this excludes from what we which we've seen before. He raises a very interesting scenario. So let's say I want I had a negative experience with this person. And it's not, it's not that I'm gonna enjoy saying it. I'm not gonna enjoy saying it. I'm confident I'm not gonna enjoy saying it. It's just an experience that I had that I feel is relevant. But as I think to myself, I say, wow, I know this guy. And this isn't even going to bother the person. Uh, let me let me explain. Uh, let me give an example. Um, somebody, I, you know, I get a lot of calls, uh, should have related questions. So somebody called me once and they said, can you tell me about so-and-so? So I, I whenever they do, I, I give like a very brief, you know, synopsis of all the wonderful qualities that I feel are true about whoever they're calling about. And then I ask, you know, and would, or I ask, do you want me to just give a general picture? Or do you want to ask questions? So at some point they want to ask questions, you know, so fine. So they say, want to know, is the person a Ben Torah? 
Now, a Ben Torah, by the way, again, I don't know if this is a Lush and Heart discussion, just a practical conversation. I find somebody gave me this advice once, and I use it all the time when people call me about Shiduchim. I ask a person to define their terms with specific examples. So the question that I get asked all the time, someone calls me up and they say, um, what's the person's hashkafa? You know, are they like modern or yeshivish or something in between? So I say, why don't you tell me what you mean? Why don't you why don't you give me like some examples of things you're thinking about? And by the way, just as an aside, those kind of questions, I don't even think that's a conversation of Lush and Hara, because that's just sort of like just giving a general sense of the person, you know, you know, what you know, whatever is our, our, do they value the state of Israel? Are our, 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 our secular studies important? Do they wanna, you know, et cetera? You know, this is just like what what what's the general profile of the person? But in any event, so this person asked me, is the person you're talking about a Ben Torah? And in my mind, a Ben Torah, wow, Ben Torah, that's like one of the nicest compliments you can give a person. This is a person who like learns a ton and like there's not an action that they do that's not dictated by Torah. And I'm thinking to myself as that question is being yes, this is a lovely person, but this guy's not a Ben Torah. I, don't, that's, I would describe this as a, but thank God I asked the person, I said, just do me a favor, what do you mean when you say, is he a Ben Torah? What are you looking for? Person says, I just want a nice boy who goes to shul sometimes. <laughs> that was the definition of a Ben Torah. I said, great. He's exactly what you're looking for. You know, and, and, and so that's a slightly humorous, I think a practical example, to be honest with you. But just imagine if I hadn't have had that exchange with the person. And let's say I know this person. And let's say it doesn't even matter to the person if, if the person learns Torah every day. And I would say, oh, he doesn't learn Torah every day. No, are you kidding? Da, da, da. I said all that stuff. And it doesn't even matter to the person. So here it is. I just conveyed some negative information and I know what I'm talking about. It's an important topic, but my audience doesn't even care. So why did I just say this negative information if it's not even going to be impactful? That's another thing he says to think about. That's Okay. Number four. Um, if the person is able to achieve the desired effect without saying this negative thing, it's better to not say Lashonara. In other words, anytime I say neg- something negative about a person, that's a very unfortunate thing. So the only allowance to say it is if I'm saving someone else. So is there a way to save the other person? Uh, Is there a way to save the other person without saying something negative? So let me just give an example. Uh, You could come up with examples like this in the world of Shiduchim, but maybe it's it's, uh, easier to think about it in a professional context. So someone calls me up and they say, you know, uh, I'm considering hiring uh, so-and-so and and I'm, I'm very, very impressed by him. And what, uh, what impresses me most about him is he gave a shear in your shul for three years. Could you tell me about that? And let's say I let's say I get it as an email. Okay. And let's say this person never, this is a theoretical example. Let's say this person never gave a shear in my shul. Uh, he came to my shul for three years and every now and then shared a Tvar Torah with the guy sitting next to him. And that became, on his resume, he gave a, a parsha shear in my shul for three years. I'm making this up as I go along. Um, as did the guy. As did the guy. So, um, so of course, the, the easy thing for, for me to say is, uh, <laughs> are you joking, you know? And, um, and that would just be very, very unfortunate. Now, there, it's probably not a good example because there's something else here because someone's going to have a teaching position and they're not even an honest person. They shouldn't have the job anyway. But just for the sake of the example, let's say I can send the communication to a person and say, you know, you wrote a beautiful resume. You, you know, you, you wrote a beautiful resume and um, and I'm going to, I've, I've gotten some requests about your resume based on your teaching experience in Shul. Um, I'm going to tell the person that it's false unless you clarify it for yourself. 
you know, and, and then theoretically I would construct a way to sort of, and I, I'll say, and by the way, I'm going to schmooze with the person in a week from now. And it's going to be very evident to me in the conversation if, if you clarified things or not. And if you haven't clarified things, then I'm going to tell the person what's what, just as a theoretical example. So sometimes there are ways, sometimes there are ways to do that. That's number four. And now number five is also very important. All of this is only permissible. It's only if the result will not be something truly terrible for the person who's being spoken about. They're not going to really do something bad to him. I'm going to put this in different words than what the Chavetz Chaim said, but basically, if the uh, result of what I share about the person is going to be much harsher than what the person deserves, I shouldn't be saying this. So, Let's let's think about this for a second. Let's say, let's say as follows. Um, let's say there's some couple, and uh, they're they're they just got engaged. They they just got engaged, and one party you, you know both people, and one party calls you a week after they got engaged and said, "Yeah, you know, I hear I don't know if you heard, I, I get a mazel tov." And um, I just want to uh, ask you, I probably should have called you before we got engaged, but I just, I just wanted to check something with you. Um, do you, do you, would you say that this person is a, you know, thoroughly responsible person? And let's say you have experiences with the fellow or the woman, and they're really not responsible. Now, Let's say you know what you're talking about. You know, it's not like you had just one, you had numerous exchanges with them. You're not going to exaggerate it. Uh, you have no pleasure in saying this over. This is, you think it's very unfortunate, but you just feel you need to say it. So, and there's no other way you can communicate it other than, you know, saying it yourself. So based on all the previous rules, there's no reason for you not to say something. But if you say, well, actually this person is, one of the most irresponsible people I know. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but you know, so it, the whole thing might get called off then. And that's going to be a terribly embarrassing thing for the person. Now, it could be, it could be that other extreme examples, it needs to get called off. Let's say there's some terrible illness that the person has that he didn't share with the other party. Let it get called off then. You, you know what I mean? But it's not at all in step that this person's a little bit irresponsible and now they're going to be, you know, the, the whole plans get dashed and things like that. That doesn't make sense. So these are the five basic rules. Um, I'm, I just want to review the rules one more time and then we'll pause just if anyone has any questions that, that have arisen in their minds from these rules. Um, by the way, if anyone's interested, the very last page of this handout is just a very loose in English, just summary of the five the five key factors. But again, just to summarize, number one is you have to actually know what you're talking about yourself. And I want to be clear, what I mean you have to know what you're talking about is not just the facts that you relay have to be accurate, but the point you're extrapolating from the facts has to be thought out and sound and not just like, maybe this makes sense. That's number one. Number two is when you relate something, it can't be with exaggeration. Um, number three is it can't be that you're deriving pleasure from the fact that you're saying this about this person or to say it differently. If you have emotional attachment to this issue, you shouldn't be the one speaking up. Um, number four, if there'd be another way to achieve the desired result without you saying these negative things about a person, you should do that. And number five, you can only go ahead and do this if the effect of what you're about to do is logically in step with what we're talking about. But if the effect is going to be terribly magnified compared to the actual issue that we're discussing, you shouldn't be speaking. 
Any comments, Menasha? Does it make a difference whether a professional reference is for a Jewish colleague or a non-Jewish Oh, it's a really good question. Thank you. And thank you for being the uh, conduit. Um, okay, so broadly speaking, broadly speaking, uh, the halacha of Lashon Hara, the, the, the prohibition of Lashon Hara, the Torah prohibition of Lashon Hara, by the way, is when a Jew is speaking about another Jew. Um, just to think about it for a second, if not for these halacha discussions, we, I mean, we hopefully wouldn't be malicious. We hopefully would make sure that whatever we're saying would be true, but we wouldn't be having all these reservations about, you know, if somebody wants a professional reference, I say what I think, you know? Um, so certainly we shouldn't be malicious about a Jew or non-Jew. Certainly we should be honest about a Jew or non-Jew, but if it's not with malicious intent and, and it's honest, these restrictions are only regarding another Jew and not regarding a non-Jew. Hope that was clear. Yeah, thank you for relaying that question. Any any other comments? Yeah, that was an important point. Excuse me for not clarifying that. Okay. So now in the Sefer Chavetz Chaim, he actually illustrates some of his points with some actual examples. So there are many more examples than what I uh, relate here, but each of these I thought sort of carries with it an interesting message. So on the... The back of the first page, at the top of it, it says, Sefer Chavetz Chaim, Yisuri Rechilos, Klal Test Siurim. Im hu roe, if a person sees, Sharuvein rotze li shtate fin Shimon, bin yane ha miskar. That Ruvain wants to partner with Shimon on a business matter. The Shimon eno makiro betivo. And Shimon really doesn't know Ruvain. You know, Ruvain's reaching out to Shimon. Shimon really doesn't know him. And he doesn't know his nature. So Levi, the third party, the observer, knows Ruvain very well. That he's very fast and loose with other people's money. So this the third party knows that Ruvain would be a terrible business partner. So it makes sense for um, Levi to reach out to Shimon and say, I understand you're discussing a business partnership with Ruvain. I don't think it's a good idea. And that fits with all the rules we said. And that wouldn't be a prohibition of Lashon Hara. That's what we call Lashon Hara This is appropriate. Okay, so we can relate to that. But his, his next point, that he's like as a, as a, a note on that, near the asterisk, be careful, my brother. Let's say it was different. The example he was giving was Ruvain doesn't take other people's money seriously. That was the initial example. Let's say that wasn't the example. Let's say it's just that Ruvain is down on his financial luck. He's a solid guy. He'd be good as a partner but he's having financial struggles right now. And uh, I want to go and tell Shimon, oh my gosh, don't touch Ruvain. Ruvain's down on his financial luck. To go and share, that would be a great sin. It's not at all comparable to the other examples that we gave. In that case, in the first case, Shimon's about to go into partnership with Ruvain, and Ruvain's going to like sign away three quarters of the finances tomorrow. Here, I don't have reason to believe that Shimon is going to have terrible loss because he's going into a business with Ruvain. Now, if, if, if the whole partnership is predicated on all the money Ruvain is bringing into the partnership and he has no money, then that's a different story because then the whole thing falls apart. Then, of course, it would be appropriate. But it's just... Oh, let me tell you something about Shimon. He he dresses nice, but he's not as successful as he seems. Uh, okay, does that mean he's going to be a bad partner? Not necessarily. There are many people we know who are wonderful at what they do, or could be wonderful at what they do, and they just haven't succeeded yet. So that's it's it's a very illustrative example. 
to just think about, I know what I'm talking about. I don't mean any malice by it. Uh, it's an important topic, but a person really needs to think about if this is core to the issue that's on the table. So I think it's a very interesting example to reflect on. And by the way, I'll just say as an aside, some of the most inspiring Shilas I get, and I do get Shilas like this, people call to ask Lashon Hara Shilas. And, and, you know, we could call to ask about pots and Hilkul Shabbos and, you know, what to do on Yom Tiv and is the sukkah good? We could call to ask Lashon Hara Shilas also. So the idea here is just to sort of lay out the general foundations, but it's, it's always very inspiring for me when I get those questions. Um, and if you want to know all the bad questions I get, I'll tell you later. No, just, okay, so uh, next example, the last paragraph on this page, Tzirim Tzir Beis. Vim kfar nishtatefimo mitzad shelo haya makiro. So this is interesting. This was similar to something we mentioned already, but a little bit different. Let's say Reuven and Shimon already went into partnership. So the example in scenario number one is you understand they're talking about it and you kind of want to cut it off at the pass. Let's say Reuben and Shimon went into partnership because Shimon really didn't know who he was dealing with. And, you know, Levi really knows uh, Reuben. Depends. If I know that I can talk to Shimon and Shimon will consider my words and you, you probably had this earlier with Rebbe Bistalnik that, that if someone tells me something negative about someone, I can be concerned about it, but I shouldn't take it as an absolute truth. So I know that Shimon will deal with it appropriately. I know. So now Shimon now knows that you heard this about Ruvain. Shimon knows he needs to look over Ruvain's shoulder. That's what Shimon has learned from what I say. You know, in other words, there need to be two signatories on every check. And I, I need to look at the bank statements. If that's the idea, then it would be appropriate for me to tell Shimon, hey, you should know this about Ruben. But if if I know they've been they've been in partnership now for three months. So I just want to tell Shimon that he should just look over Ruvain's shoulder with things. But I know, I know Shimon, that if I tell Shimon that Ruvain's a little fast and quick with other people's money, so if I know Shimon's personality and I know that if I tell Shimon this, he's going to drop the whole partnership. And, and because, in other words, he's going to be so upset, he's going to feel bad that he, he went into business with him. And that reaction would not be commensurate with what I'm saying. Does that make sense to everybody? In other words, that would be a terrible blow to Ruvain, and that's not appropriate. So this is a really interesting thing to think about because, because this scenario is to say that even if there's something that I know that if Ruvain would have known, if Shimon would have known it ahead of time, he wouldn't have even gone into the partnership with him. But that would be an extreme reaction. I can't tell Shimon. It's a very interesting thing. Now, I want to clarify, if they haven't gone into the partnership yet, this is what the Chafetz Chaim is saying. If they haven't gone into the partnership yet, and I know that if I tell Shimon, he's going to say, I'm not, I don't want to go into partnership with the guy that I have to look over his shoulder. I, I'm not going to go into the partnership with him. That wouldn't be a problem. In other words, because there's plenty of times where people are considering and thising and thating and they decide to go with someone else. That wouldn't be a terrible blow to the potential partner. But once they've come together and now you tell them something that's going to dissolve the partnership, that's a terrible blow. So that, that's a really interesting thing. So that means that what we're saying is not only does whatever happens have to be commensurate with the crime, so to say, crime, right? But timing makes a difference also in terms of assessing that. What are we going here? So what... 
So, so just to give a theoretical example, what I was thinking about, I, I know what you mean. I think I know what you mean. What I was thinking about is, let's say, let's say it's not that I know that Ruvain is fast and loose with other people's money. It's that I know that Ruvain has been fast and loose. I'm a computer expert, and I went, I went, I, I went over to Ruvain's uh, computer, and I, so theoretically speaking, and I saw, and 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 I saw his, I saw what he's doing. I saw he's, he's stealing half of Shimon's money. So then, that's definitely those Samar Adam Reyecha. But if it's that, you know, you can't, I wouldn't completely trust him. So if you are confident that Shimon's reaction to that will be to, to, to blow the whole thing up after it's already started, and that will destroy Ruvain. And, and at that point, on, on some level, to be honest with you, Shimon carries a certain amount of um, responsibility because clearly he didn't look into things well enough. It's, it's, I mean, this is a surprising thing. It's a surprising thing to think On about. On the other hand, it could be that Shimon, three months into this partnership, is starting to, to worry. And it could be that he needs this other information because he needs right. to know, am I just right. imagining things or right. is there something going on? Right, so, so that's a really good point. So it seems that the way to look at all of this is that I'm not allowed to say negative things about another Jew unless it's clear to me that all the required parameters are fulfilled. So if I know that Shimon is the kind of guy to approach things appropriately, then I can go ahead and do it. But if I know that Shimon's not that kind of guy, I really shouldn't. Now, if Shimon were to come to me and say, you know, I'm starting to have a bad feeling about this, then that might be different. That might be more like what Rebecca Greengart was talking about. But I'm saying, but it would obviously the details of all this would matter a lot. What this also tells me gets back to your previous thing with the Shidduch example, which is if somebody comes to me to ask a question about a third party, it's not only do I have to, obviously I have to know the third party or I shouldn't even be asking the question. Is this, I right. know, then I just say, I don't really know. I also have to get some sense of the person who's asking the question. Is that person the act every little thing, et cetera? Or like your example, what's he when he uses these terms? What does he mean? All these kinds of right. things. It becomes both sides. It's a it's a very interesting observation. And obviously, practically speaking, when we get those kind of phone calls, we don't have the slightest clue who we're talking to. Sometimes we do, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. I, I think absent clarity, I, I, I think we should just assume we're talking to we should just assume we're talking to an average person so that if, if, if somebody, um, they want to know how is, is this person courteous or not? Well, I don't know if I tell them that he cut me off in, 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 uh, in the carpool line the other day, you know, how are they going to react to it? the average person, by the way, the average person is going for Shaduchim. They are a private eye and they, and everyone's different. But the average person, they are a private eye, and they are going to call every detail they can. So if I tell them that he cut me off in, in, in the carpool line three weeks ago, that I, I, I probably shouldn't say that because that's probably going to be this big deal, which that doesn't make any sense to me. Now, if if honest to goodness, they're just an exceedingly rude person, now then I have to think about how can I say that in, in, in a polite way. But in terms of Hilchus Lush and Hara, that, that would probably be a different story. I have an interesting question here online. Uh, if I don't share negative info and the deal goes south, do I have any financial responsibility? Okay, okay. I want to go to the next halakha. Um, it's not about, I, I'm not going to speak to, in terms of financial responsibility, the answer is no. But let's ask it in an ethic, on an ethical plane because I think it's similar to, to, to the question being asked. You'll see what I mean. Siurim Gimel, Siur Gimel, it's the next page. The Da'od, you should also know. The Ma'od Tzarek Lizoyer Shuliyaritz the Ruvain Sheishtati from Shimon in who Yodea Shumreyasa. So now let's go back. Shimon, uh, so now I Shimon calls me up, and Shimon says, you know, I, I we're friends, and I know you know Ruvain also. What do you think about our, us going to business together? And it's not that Ruvain is. Uh, it's not that I know that Ruvain is 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 fast. Uh, fast and loose with other people's money. Let's say not that way. Let's say the example is that 
I've only had one or two professional exposures to Ruvain, and I have not found him to be a, a professional, conduct himself in a professional manner. Now, do I have enough of a context to say negative stuff about Ruvain? Not really. I mean, it, again, you know, if, if my example is bad, but you understand the concepts. So what's the halacha there? So if I don't have enough of a context to speak, so I shouldn't say anything bad, right? But there's someone on the other on the other side of the line, and he says, "So, do you recommend I go into business with Ruvin or not?" So I've decided I'm not going to say no. So what do I say? Yes. Oh, he's a great guy. Oh, I wish I wish I had money to go into business with somebody. I would do it with Ruvin. So if I have concern, even if that concern is not appropriate to relate. I can't be going and telling Shimon to go into business with him. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, by the way, here the Chavetz Chaim mentions, I, a better example than what I said, I don't have anything negative to say fundamentally about Ruvain, but gosh, I, do I, I don't even know if Shimon knows that Ruvain has like nothing in the bank. Now, there's not, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to say that about Ruvain. That's not, that's not core to the matter, at least not how Shimon is describing it. But does the Shimon know that Ruvain cannot back himself up financially at all? So let's say we've decided that it's not core and I shouldn't say it. So I got to keep my mouth shut. But if I was Shimon, I'm not sure I would go into business with Ruvain. So he says... And by the way, he says, This is really interesting. Someone calls up about a shidduch question and they ask such and such about a person. So I'll, I'll, I'll give this. There's someone calls about someone and I really don't know the person well, but I, I, what can I tell you? Every time I interact with the person, something rubs me the wrong way. I can't even, I can't even put my finger on it. Something rubs me the wrong way. So... It's not enough. I, I don't. I, I can't even put my finger on it myself. I'm not, that's lush and horror for me to say this about a person. But for me to say, oh, I think it's a great idea. That would be wrong too. I'm on the, the next paragraph there. If the luck is that I can't say something negative about one, that doesn't mean that I should say to the other, oh, go for it. Then I'm in violation of giving bad advice. So I, 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 am I being clear? Is this making sense? So, so the point seems to be that I have to be able to say the words, I don't know the person well, which is difficult for us because we know everything about anything. We know that. Right, so this is a big takeaway. I was very struck by this. That if the luck is, I can't say something, but there is something bothering me, I just have to say, you know, I really don't know the person well. Um, so, so, so you're saying if I really do know the person well, so, so how do I avoid? Well, I mean, again, obviously, we have to use some of our own creativity, but. Oh, I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one that I say sometimes. Sometimes I say, and by the way, if I say this to someone, it doesn't mean that I know something bad about a person because sometimes it's just, I mean, it actually is true what I'm about to say. You know, I just don't see it. You know, you, you know what I mean? In other words, what? A, a little power, but, but, but I, I'm saying that someone calls me up and suggest, by the way, when it, when I really say this, when it's not that I'm trying to avoid Ilkhus Lashonara, is sometimes someone calls me up and I just think it's one of these things, it's going to be like such a waste of time for both parties. There, there's, there's no, whoever made that suggestion doesn't know what in the world they're talking about, about either person. I mean, like they're just, you know. So they ask, what if, someone suggests that I meet so-and-so. What do you say, Rebbe Rosenbaum? So in those kind of situations, and, I, and I'll say, it's nothing bad about the person. They're a lovely, lovely person. You're a lovely person. I just, I just don't see it. You know, it's hard for me to see that. Now, if a person takes that, 
and they say, okay, I'm going to do it anyway, then that's their own decision. But I'm just recommending that if a person sort of wants out of it, or in a business context, a person can say, I'll tell you something, they seem like a lovely person, but I don't know enough about how your business operates. To know, I tell people, sometimes you want to play dumb and it comes naturally to me. You know, I, I, I don't know enough about how your business operates to really advise you appropriately. That's another, Dr. Myra. Absolutely, you could say, you know, you could talk to Yanko. Now, Yanko might not, might not appreciate that, but that's not your problem. Now, what you could do in all seriousness, and I've had this experience before, um, I think more times I've been on the receiving end of it, but every now and then, you know, every now and then there's someone who it's complicated. It's a complicated conversation. Sometimes I get a phone call from someone. Hi, I just wanted to give you a heads up. Someone just called me about a shit question about so-and-so and I don't know them so well, or maybe I do know them and I didn't know how to play it. I recommend that they call you. So that actually is a great chesed to Yankel because you're actually giving Yankel the opportunity to, to think it through a little bit, which as we're seeing is, is a good thing when one has the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Ready? Because in the power, the person that called the representative is not such a great right. catch either. Right. Do you still give the same answer to another caller? Because you're a stranger. Your view, even if it's true or not true, to me, it's dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Because I say, he is a great guy. Okay, now, now I just set up a shit up with a great guy and a lousy girl. Yeah. You know, right. Because I didn't right. Right. On the right. So I think that's a very interesting point. The way I look at it is I try to stay in my lane. You know, in other words, this person was calling to find out about person X. I didn't suggest the shidduch. I'm not saying they should. I don't even know you, you know, but I'll tell you about, about person X. Now, I agree with you that if I have something not so flattering to say about person X, and I don't even know the person I'm talking to. Um, I, I, I don't think I don't think I would be comfortable saying things to like a stranger because for all I know, like you know, now, right, right, it would be, but it would be wrong for me to actively. It would be wrong for me to speak untruthfully. That would be wrong in in, in the vast majority of cases. That would be wrong for me to speak untruthfully. But but presumably, my role in that situation, I could say something like, you know, these are the answers to the questions. I mean, you know, these are the answers to the questions. Um, more than that, I, I, I don't really know you, so I, I can't really, you know, but um, I, will, I will just say something as an aside. Um, I mean, this is something that I justify to myself to a certain extent. If somebody sent out a, a profile of themselves and they put my name on it, so they're basically inviting people to call me about them. You, 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 know, you, know, you know what I mean? So um, I do want to tell you, and I, I think with this will probably end, but, but I, I do want to mention one thing, and people can do with this as they like, but I actually think, um, you know, in our world, most of us know, most of us can find out something not so flattering about people who knows where, because everybody knows somebody, somebody, sorry, everybody knows somebody somewhere, et cetera. So actually what I like to do when there's something clearly not the standard is I actually see my role as putting it in context. Do, do, you, do you know what I'm saying? In other words, and as I actually think I'm not even helping the person who's being called about if I just say everything's hunky-dory when there's stuff that I know they're going to find out about the person and they're going to like wonder why didn't anybody tell me that? I know they're going to find out. I know they're going to find out about this, about the person's family and this and this and this. And so if I can put it in a positive context, um, like ways that I've seen the person grow as a greater person because of these challenges, I feel like that's my job to a certain extent. Yeah, You know what I mean? But I agree with you that, the, by the way, there's a whole separate issue. If there's something that I only know in confidence, it's not my business to say it. This is, what do I know from being a person of the street? 
you know, a person in the neighborhood. I, I think that's, I think that is correct, if, if, if that made sense. Yeah, if you know something truly incongruous, but you know that this is really a deal breaker, you got to say... Okay, so now let me give one more example, and 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 I think with that we really should stop because I don't want them to say lashon her about me that I made Minka start late. Um, so imagine imagine the following situation: Let's say someone calls me about a certain shidduch, and I know that the person that they're calling about uh, has a very serious illness. Now I ask you: Does a person have a right to know about that before they get engaged to someone? Does a person have a right to know about that? I think so. I think so. I think so. Okay. Does person X have the responsibility to share it before they even meet? Certainly not. You know, so you have all these questions about like, you know, when in the process did you share it? Different, different people will give different advice to that. So that's something that's really private. And I know it in a context of privacy, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to share it in that context. But I want to loop back to something we spoke about before. And the thing we spoke about before was, let's say I know this about the person and I know that the other party has a right to know. So it could be that I'll call a person X and I keep tabs on it a little bit. It could be I call a person X maybe right after they get engaged. I mean, you have to, you have, to have the license to do such a thing. But I said, forgive me for asking this. I just need to know, did you share your issue with the person? You know what I mean? And and if not, that's when that's when you get into a situation. Again, this would definitely be a Shiloh, but that's when you get to a situation where it might be the right thing for me to call up the person and say, I just need to make sure that you know this. Yeah, that's 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 stuff the stuff of Shilas. That's not uh that's not even if you were here in person, you can't do that on your own, you know, Zoom or in person. But um um yeah, I hope that made sense. But again, the you know, let, let's let's hold here. We could talk about it privately if you want. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Again, thank you, Rebbe Stalnik. Thank you, Menasha. Thank you, those present and those on Zoom. And again, if it's of interest to people, sort of just the basic highlights of the key factors are the last page. But again, this is really good things to know, to consider, but it's fine to ask Shilas. It's good to ask Shilas because a lot of these situations are complicated. Thank you very much.